Welcome to Math Mini Lessons. This is part one of our six day math review for the New York State exam. So if you've gone through the exam on your own, make sure you're identifying which problems were probably challenging, which ones you're not sure about, because we're gonna go through them one by one and see, uh, I'll share my answers and my strategies for each one. For day one for sixth grade, it's all multiple choice. And there is no calculator for this part. So you should not have used a calculator for any of it. Now, uh, what I will tell you in this section, I'm going to go through them four at a time and give you the answers for one, two, three, four. And if you can check off in your work, if you had something that you, you had a different answer for, you're not sure why, watch that section of the video and I'll explain my strategy and show how to find it. And if you had all four correct, you can just move on to the next section. And I'll do the same thing for five, six, seven, and eight. And I'll do this entire part for all of part one till we get to the end. Okay, Math Marbles? So I hope you find this helpful. Take out your test paper and your pencil, and we're going to jump right in. Here are the answers for the first three problems in sixth grade. You have C, B, and C. If you have all three of these correct, please check on and keep going to the next section. If not, stay right here so we can go through those problems. In number one, we have a grocery store. They sell five lemons for $2, and we want to know the, the unit cost for each lemon. So this is our rate. And we want the unit rate, which is gonna tell us what one lemon costs. That's what we're looking for. So we're gonna make a ratio table, cost, lemons, and for $2, we get five lemons. We wanna know what one lemon will cost. I'm gonna put an N. I'm gonna cross multiply so we can make an equation. And five times N is five N, and two times one is two. So here's my equation, two is equal to five N. Now, you have some choices here. You could, rewrite this in another way. Um, I want the n by itself, so I want to divide by five. Why? Because five divided by five is just one, and I just wanna have one n or just n. But whatever you do to one expression, you have to do to the other. So I have two fifths. Now I know that I can't leave my answer like this because that's not how money works. So I'm going to rewrite this as a division problem. So I can do it two ways. I can look at it and read it from top to bottom and say two divided by five. So that's one way, two divided by five. And you can write it like this. Or sometimes I have kids who still don't remember that trick and they like this one even better. They imagine what if you are running and you push the two over inside the house. So that's another way where you can think of it like, oh, the five stays and the two falls in. So some kids really like that. But now we can divide. Five cannot go into two, but it goes into 24 times. And I have zero left, so I'm going to put a zero on the top. And so one lemon is 40 cents. And there's your answer, C. Let's go to the next one. And what in this one, we wanted to know the location of one negative one and one third. So that's important, it has to be negative. And I know that my smaller numbers are on the left and my bigger numbers are on the right. And I'm paying attention to where the zero is. So I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger for a second. So here's zero. And I know because this is negative, it has to be to the left of zero, it has to be over here. So that means S is absolutely not gonna be the right answer. We're gonna just cut that one out right there. And I also know that negative one has to be some, negative one and one third is gonna be somewhere between negative one and negative two. It's gonna be between these two numbers. So it's gonna to have to be between here and here. So that means R is also not the correct answer. So here's the last thing to recognize that I want the one third. Pay attention to see how many pieces are cut to get to the first number. Okay, so I'm going to use one because it's easy and I can see that it's broken up into thirds. So one third, two thirds, three thirds. Same thing is going to be true even though I'm going to the left. So this is one negative one third, negative two thirds, negative three thirds, or negative one. And I want, here we go again, one third, negative one and one third. Here it is Q. The answer is Q. 
All right, so lots of things to pay attention to for this one. Let's go to the next one on the bottom. A bakery owner bakes 450 cookies every day. So, ooh, that's important. 450 cookies each day. Which equation can be used to determine the number of cookies for any number of days? So, he does 450 cookies each day. I want to know the total for any day. Well, that means I'm just going to take 450 and I'm going to multiply it by the days to figure out those total number of cookies. So let's test that. What if I have two days? Well, 450 each day. So 450 one day plus 450 another day, that's 900 cookies. So this does work. 450 times two is 900. So that is the correct equation. Hip hop, next one's four, five, and six. For four, your answer is B. For five, it's C. And for six, it's A. So if you have those three answers, B, C, or A, check off, go to the next section. If not, we're gonna go through them right here. With the first part, Greta writes her rational numbers from least to greatest, meaning the smaller numbers are on the left and the bigger numbers are on the right. Which one is the correct set? So when I first started this, I started by not knowing which one. And when I looked at the first set, this made it not true. Zero is not smaller than 16. So when I was thinking about it, I was like, that doesn't make sense. So I crossed that out. Then I looked at the second set and I went one at a time. Negative 18 is less than negative 5.5. And then I had 17 tenths, a positive 17 over 10 is greater than negative 5.5. And now I wanted to compare these two. So I just changed this to a mixed number. This is one and seven tenths, and this is four. And yeah, one and seven tenths is less than four. So this is the correct order. The other ones had an error in it somewhere. So for example, here, negative 13 is not bigger than zero. And for here, these two negative numbers are not bigger. So you can jot that down. Let's look at this one here, and I needed to represent the perimeter as an expression. Uh, so I need to rewrite this. I'm gonna start here at the bottom Z, and I notice there's one Z. Then I notice that there were two Y's. And then I notice there were one, two, three, four, five X's. So I'm looking for these terms. Those three terms added up together. So in the first one, I have the 5x, I have the 2y, but I don't have the z, so I crossed it out. B is just completely wrong because I don't have my coefficients for y and z. C is correct. And for D, that just didn't make any sense, where they just counted up. They separated the coefficients from the variables. That's just wrong. So there you have your answer for five. Let's go on to six. And for six, we have some coordinate pairs and which one is graphed correctly. Now, when we graph points, the first pair, the first number is our X. That's gonna tell us if you're going left or right. And then the second one, the Y, tells us if you go up or down. <coughs> so think of it, if I wanted to dunk a basketball, I'm playing basketball, another stick figure, here's my basketball, I'm bouncing it. If I wanna dunk this ball, I gotta run down before I jump in the air. So that's the way to think of it. You're always going left or right first and then up. Run down, then up or down, then jump. Or if I have an airplane, if a plane is flying in the air, it's a really bad airplane. When it's on the runway, it has to go down the runway in the airport before it flies in the air. So it has to go down the runway before it goes up in the air. Same thing for these points. So here's my first one. To get to that point, I have to go left five, up five. So that's negative five, five. And why is it negative? Because it's to the left of zero, the left of that origin. Let's go to our next point over here. You do have to just plot all of them just to see which one works. So let me get my little pointer. To get there, I have to go right two, 
up four. So here you go, two, four. Looks like I could have written that four better. So, so far, those two are correct. To get to this one, we're gonna go down two. Oops, no, 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 no. Over six, down two, there we go. See how easy it is to make a mistake to flip those? But we always go down the runway before we go up or down. Always has to be that direction. It's so easy to flip these around. So it's down to six, and then I went down to. And then here's our last point. Which way do I go? Do I go this way or do I go that way? You go down the runway X first. Oops, I, I passed it to negative three, and then down to six. And that was our last point. So there you have it. Biggest hotspot, people just get these backwards all the time. They just flip their X and their Y over. So if it helps, just look X first. It's over here. It's on left, right, and then the Y is up and down. So there you have it. Make any corrections. We're going to go to the next. Here the next three, seven, eight, nine. Oh yeah, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> That's a, no joke, isn't it? For number seven, the answer is C. For eight, it's C. And for nine, it's D. So we have two geometry, one NS problem. So let's start with the first one for number seven. And for this one, we wanted to know the surface area. And that means I need the area for all these different pieces. So I need to know how to find the area of a triangle. And for area of a triangle, we're doing one half base times height. So when I look at my triangle here, my base is eight. How do I know that? Because all sides of my square are eight. So my area would be one half eight times 10. Let's simplify that one half times 80 and half of 80 is 40. So that's the area for this triangle. Is it true for all the other ones? Absolutely. So the area for all of these triangles is 40. And now we just have to do the part in the middle. Eight times eight is 64. So we're gonna add those together. Well, 40 plus 40 plus 40 for 40, I can just do 40 times four plus 64. So that's 160 plus 64, which is equal to 224. So jot that one down if you didn't have it. And this formula, super important. Let's go to the next one. Now we have volume. We want the volume and we have another net. So what will be the volume? And it is a cube. So that means that it's all sides to the third power. Now, if you're not sure, you could have just figured out length with height. And because it's saying it's a cube, I know that every single side has a four. So if you would have done that, you would have just had four times four times four, or the same as four to the third power. Both would be the same. Uh, either way, we don't have calculators, so you do have to solve this. Four times four is 16, and 16 times four is 64. Either way, there you have it. You have your complete answer. Jot it down or make any corrections if you need to. And let's go to number nine. In this one, we have a number line and it says point zero is C level. So which statement has to be true? So here's where the zero is. And so I'm gonna put that at C level. Now, if you're doing this on a computer for your computer-based test, you notice you're not gonna be able to draw on your picture. You can't highlight it or you couldn't the year I took this test. So you can just redraw this. And so what this is telling me is definitely telling me that Q is at C level. Anything above it is above C level. Anything below it is below C level. Okay. So let's look at what we have here. For the first one, we're just gonna eliminate. Cities P and Q are above C level. Well, P is, but not Q. So that's wrong. For B, 
Q and R are above sea level. No, that's not true for either one. Q and R are below sea level. Uh, for C, P is above sea level and Q is below sea level. That's the tricky one. This is our distractor because this is true, but Q is right at sea level. So that is not true. And let's see the last one. P, city P is above sea level. Yep. And city R is below. Yep. So that one is true. So this one, you have to do some reading to really figure out what's up. Here's our next three, 10, 11, 12. So C, A, C. If you have all three correct, go to the next section. If not, stay right here. So for the first one, we want to know what value of C makes this true. So we need to know which of those numbers, if we put for C, will make it true. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this a, a simpler question by combining some like terms. Uh, 12 minus 9 will give us 3. And 3 plus C is equal to 12. Now this is something I can figure out. The only thing that would make this true is 9. 3 plus 9 is equal to 12. So there we have it. And, or another way you could have done this is you could have just tried putting these numbers in. So like if you would have tried to put a zero in there, 12 minus 9 is 3. 3 plus 0 is not 12. And you could just have substituted for all of these and just tried them out. 12 plus 9 is 3. 3 plus 3 is not 12. And you could have also done that if you wanted to. Let's look at number 11. A zoo has 12 toucans and 60 parrots what is the ratio of toucans to parrots so part of you is like duh it's right here but what they're looking for is the ratio this is what they're not saying so i'm going to say the quiet part out loud they want it in simplest terms so i'm going to make my ratio table i want toucans and parrots because that's what they want toucans to parrots so that's 15 to 60 and I need to simplify it so we need a greatest common factor for this what would be the greatest common factor for 15 and 60 one thing you could do is just start listing your factor pairs so for 15 you could have done just 1 and 15 and 2 is not a factor but 3 and 5 is a factor and I have my factor pairs and if four is not a factor, you would have gotten five, which is repeated. So I don't write that one. But then you have to do the same thing for 60. So I definitely know one and 60, two and 30, three and 20 is for a factor. If you get stuck on that, you probably have to use your paper to just figure it out. So some of you might be doing this and going, oh, four times 15. And that's fine if you need to do that. So four, 15, and then let's do the next one, five and 12, six and 10, seven is not a factor, eight is not a factor, nine is not a factor. And here you can see all the things they have in common, they both have a one, they both have a three, they both have a five, and they both have a 15, which is the biggest one. So 15 is our greatest common factor. Why do I need that? Because I'm now going to simplify by 15. Here's the great thing about the factor pairs. You kind of know when you divide it by 15 what the other number is. That's why I like it. Oh, sorry, picked the wrong one. There you go, four. So I, that's kind of why I like factor pairs a lot because I can see what the other number is and just put it in there. So my simplest one is one over four or one to four, which is our answer right here. So again, just high level. Um, my first ratio is just a ratio I found, and then I had to simplify in the next one. Making my factor pairs really helps me to do that. I have to find the greatest common factor first, which is 15. And then I know what its pair is. That's the number that goes 
next to it in my ratio box. All right, let's go to the next one. And I kind of covered a little bit at the bottom, so I'm gonna just erase that a little bit. Just so we have it. There we go. Which expression is equivalent to 14 less than? So 14 less than. So I'm gonna subtract 14 from something. The product of eight and y. So the product of eight and y, that's easy, it's just eight y. So I want 14 less than this. So 8y minus 14. So the easiest way people mess this up is they flip it around. So this is our distractor. And that's because we read it from less to right and that less than is what messes us up. So that's our distractor, okay? And so it has to be 14 less than the eight and y. Hit pause and jot this one down into your notes. Here are the next two, 13 and 14. The answers are B and C. And for 15, the answer is B. So we have a geometry, an NS, and an EE problem. So if you have them, go to the next section. If not, stay here. So for the first one, you want the least common multiple of, seven, of nine and 12, so LCM. That means, let's see, I have few factors, but many multiples, many multiples. So I'm gonna keep on making more and more. So here's nine, here's 12. And I wanna find the smallest number they have in common. Okay. So 18, I just want to do the first five, 18, 27, 36, 45, and I'll do 12s because I can go on forever with both of them, 24, 36, 48, and 60. And now you're going to stop and look to see if they have anything in common. And they do, they have 36. If you kept on going though, would they have anything else in common? Yeah. If you kept making this bigger and bigger, the next one you would have in common would have been 72. Because then you would have gotten on this one, if I would have kept going with my nines, I would have 54, 63, and then 72, which would have been in common. The other thing I see a lot of kids do, is they just do, well, nine times 12 is 108, and that is a multiple. Yes, it's a multiple, but it's not your least common multiple. So instead of just multiplying them together, just make a list and skip count. I like to do it in, in like sets of four or five, and then look, stop and look. Let's look at number 14. Ooh, this one looks spicy. We gotta simplify this. We definitely, definitely have to simplify this and, and it looks really, really weird, but that's okay. So we're gonna do everything on the top part first. So three times seven minus two plus five to the third divided by two. I'm gonna use my GEMDAS. And first we're gonna take care of anything with groupings. And our grouping is right here in parentheses. So if you do PEMDAS, it's fine. GEMDAS just means any type of grouping symbol. So seven times, uh, seven minus two is five. So now I have three times five plus five to the third divided by two. Let's deal with that exponent. And we have it over here, five to the third power. If you need to, then you can go and figure out what is five times five times five and you'll get 125. So I'm gonna rewrite that. Three times five plus 125 divided by two. Now, I can't just do this bottom division part yet. I gotta do everything up on the top first. Just have to. So we're gonna do our multiplication, this section here. And three times five is 15. 15 plus 125 divided by two. And now I'm just gonna do that 15 plus 125. And that would be 140 divided by two. And that final step, I would just get 70. And there's my answer. So the key to this part is I, got, I had to do all this up top before this. And if that really confuses you, because it, it can confuse a lot of kids, I could rewrite this whole sentence. And I'll show you how if this helps. 
all of this is being divided by two. That might really help you when looking at your problem. Um, and then I, I've, depending on your teacher, they might use a different symbol for this, or they maybe I'd use a bracket. And that's why grouping is so important. I have to do everything in that group first, because all of that is being divided by two. And then you would have done the same thing. Three times five, plus five to the third, 15, whoops. Three times five plus 125, 15 plus 125, and then you would have gotten the same thing, 140, and then you could divide by two. So in each stage, you're just making this part inside smaller until you get to that last part, okay? So yeah, this one was spicy. Um, very tough problem. I totally get why a lot of kids don't really struggle with it and just looking at it it looks scary just don't, don't get scared you know these steps so if you wanted to do it like the top you can do it that way or you could have rewritten it in this way so that you knew you had to do all this first before you divide it by two all right we're gonna pause here hit pause jot this down into your notes and like anything if you're really stuck on something and you want to see another video or you have questions put the questions in the comments I put comments on this video so like, Let's go to number 15 and then we'll do the next three. In this one, we want to know the area of the part that is not shaded. What is the area of the part that is not shaded? So I want to know the area for this section here. So what I want to do is I'm going to find the area of everything and then I'm going to take out this little triangle. That's going to be my plan. So the area of the whole thing would be, oops, I almost put five, but I want the entire part, eight times seven, not five times seven, I want the whole thing. So my whole area would be 56. That's for the whole rectangle. This little triangle right here, my area is one half base height, or one half five times four, which is 20. So half of 20, is 10. So this little part is 10. So to find this section, if the whole thing is 56, I'm going to do 56 minus 10 to get this part and I get 46. Okay. So does that make sense? This entire thing here from here to here is 56. If I take out this part here, 56 minus 10, I'm left for 46 these two pieces make 56. All right, so let's jot this one down into your notes. This one was a little spicy too, eh, a little mild. It wasn't that spicy, but it was getting there. Hit pause and jot this down. And let's get to the next three. We have 16, the answer is C. And 17, we have D. And 18, we have A. All right, so let's start with 16. We wanna know which two are equivalent to each other. So let's look at the first one. Uh, when I look at the first one, our three X's, this three X is not the same as X to the third power. That's a distractor. For the second one, we're gonna combine like terms. because That's how we're simplifying. 14 X's, let's rewrite that so you can see what I'm doing. 14 X's minus two X's, I'm putting them next to each other, plus 10. When I simplify these two, because I'm gonna combine them because they're like terms, I end up with 12 X plus 10. That is not equal to 16 X plus 10. So, false. All right, with C, I get 12X plus 16X. I can combine those terms. So I can make 28X. Let's look at the other side. Four times three X plus four X. We're gonna distribute. Four times three is 12X plus 16X. I already recognize it, I already see it. And when I combine them, I also get 28. X. So C is correct. So we have that one. And the reason why D doesn't work is because I can't combine any of these like terms. So this entire statement is not equal 
that expression is not equal to this expression. All right, jot that one down. Let's go to 17. And we wanna know out of all these different elevations, which one is the closest to sea level? And we know sea level is equal to zero. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna draw a number line and here's my zero. And it's not gonna be exact, but we're gonna think about this. And we're gonna think about the absolute value for these. That's another way we could do this, hint, hint, hint. Uh, so for the first one, I have positive 83. And so that's 83 away from zero. That's what the absolute value would be, would be 83 away from zero. Uh, negative 122. So how far away is that from zero? 122 away from zero. Uh, 456, that's way up here. And that's easy, that's 456 away from zero. And lastly, we have negative 17, which is just 17 away from zero. So just looking at these, the one that's closest to zero is this one here, the negative 17. So that's swimming. So not only, yes, you can draw it on a number line, but sometimes it takes that extra step to also recognize how far each of those values from zero, especially since drawings aren't always exact, like they might not be the scale. All right, let's look at this next one. Uh, we wanna know which is the coefficient. And when we know that's kind of, that's a number next to a variable. And here is our coefficient. Okay, because that's all. All right, our next three are all on the same page. You have C, B, and C. So check off, did you get C, B, and C? If you did, Go to the next section if not stay right here and we're gonna go over this little part all together all right let's start with 19 which is a ratio problem so i'm probably gonna need a ratio table debno has six teaspoons of salt the ratio of teaspoons to tablespoons is three to one how many tablespoons does he have okay so we have our rate well we have our ratio so i'm going to make my table and I want teaspoons to tablespoon. I don't wanna just put a T for both of them because I can get confused. So teaspoons to tablespoons is three to one. And he has six teaspoons. So I wanna make sure, it's so easy for kids to just put the six in the wrong box by, by just making a silly mistake. And they get all the math right, but because of that one setup, it's a, a wrong solution. All right, and here's our unknown. We're going to cross multiply. 1 times 6 is 6. 3 times x is 3x. 3x is equal to 6. I'm going to divide both sides by 3. And so x is equal to 2. Done. Let's go to number 20 with Steve. He's ordered some cases for his baseball cards. Each case has a length of 12 a width of 6.5 and a height of 1.25. What is the volume? <sighs> volume is equal to length times width times height. I'm sighing because I know I'm gonna have to multiply all these numbers. So 12 times 6.5 times 1.25. And it is so easy to make a computation error. So we're gonna be as careful as possible. Let's start with 12 times 6.5. And two times five is 10. Two times six is 12 plus one is 13. And one times six, well, one times five is five and one times six is six. I was just gonna write 65. I'm being really honest, but I'll do it one at a time. I'm slowing myself down so I don't make errors. Okay. Now I had one number behind the decimal, so I need to have one number behind the decimal, one digit. So I'm getting 78 times 125. That's my next one. All right, so let's do that next one here. Eight times five is 40. Two times eight is 16 plus four is 20. And eight plus two is 10. 
don't forget your placeholder. Seven times five. Now, before I do the seven times five, I want to just move those two numbers so I don't get mixed up. Seven times five is 35. Seven times two is 14. 14 plus three is 17. And seven plus one is eight. So I get nine, seven, five, zero. But this time, two digits have to be behind the decimal. And there we have it. So yeah, that was kind of boring, but I want it to be slow because I'm gonna make a super big confession to you, Math Marbles. The number of times I make stupid mistakes when I rush is unbelievable. It happens. Does that mean I don't know math? Clearly not. I do math all the time, but it does mean I'm sometimes careful when I'm rushing because I'm not paying attention as, as well as I should. So I intentionally slow myself down. And that's why a lot of your teachers ask you to really show your work. And it's because they want you to slow yourself down. So you're not making silly errors. As we all know, you know how to multiply or, or by sixth grade, most people have figured out how to multiply pretty well. So there you have it. So you can jot it down if you need to. We're gonna go on to 21. A quadrilateral is drawn on a coordinate with points negative 4, 8, 6, 8, 6, 4, and negative 4, 4. What is the length in units of side AB? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a sketch. And I'm going to put these points in. So A is negative 4 and 8. So that's A. B is 6, 8. So I'm going to go to 6. So here's B. 6, 8. And I'm recognizing they only want me to find a distance from here to here. So could I draw the rest? Yeah, I could. Uh, do I really need to? No, because I just want from A to B. So I'm not going to draw the rest of it. Um, and I just want the distance from here to here. So I'm going to figure out, like, if this is zero, I know from here to here is four. Negative four is four away from zero. And from here to here is six. So six is four away. And so my total distance is 10. If you had drawn the rest of it out, it just doesn't help you. Those would have been the other two points. And it just wouldn't have done anything because we really just need those distances. Now, some kids may make the mistake and try to figure, use the wrong coordinate. But remember, I'm trying to figure out this distance from left to right is always my X value. Love it when they're all on the same page. So here's our answers for 22, 23, and 24. D, A, C. Check them all. If you have it, go to the next timestamp. If not, stay where you are. We're going to go over it. For the first part, we have the expression 5b plus c to the third power when b equals 11 and c is 4. So we're going to substitute. So we're going to put our values of b. So when 5, uh, when b is 7, so I'm going to put a parentheses around it. So I know that it's not 57, it's 5 times 7 plus 4 to the third power. And now you can use your order of operations. Uh, 4 to the third power is 64. Why? Because 4 times 4 times 4. 4 times 4 is 16 times 4 is 64. And 3 times 5 is 35. And when you add those two together, you get 99. There you go. Let's do the next one, which is another ratio problem. So my head already goes, we're probably going to do a ratio table. Let's see. A basketball player attempts 15 baskets in one day. He makes nine. Okay, so he made nine out of 15 in the game. That's pretty good. Which ratio describes the number of baskets the player made to the number of baskets attempted? Okay, so made over attempted. So I am going to make a ratio table because I'm probably going to have to simplify this. He made nine out of 15 shots. I need to simplify 9 over 15. So you need, again, your greatest common factor. So I'm making my pairs 1 times 9 and 3 times 3. 1 times 15 and 
3 times 5. What do they have in common? The 3. So that's really cool because now we know we're going to divide by 3. And 9 divided by 3 is 3. And 15 divided by 3 is 5. And boom, that is our simplest ratio right there. All right. Let's want to let's go to the last one over here. Which expression is equivalent to? I'm gonna put it in blue. Actually, the highlighter. Eight two a plus three b minus two b. All right. Eight times two a plus three b minus two b. Uh, we're gonna distribute first, and we get eight times two is sixteen a. 8 times 3 is 24b, so I don't forget that, minus 2b. Look to see, and these two are common, are common terms, like terms. I forgot for a second. So 16a plus 24 minus 2 is 22, 22b. And there you have it, see. So hit pause and jot this one down into your notes. This one was Almost done, two sets to go. So here's 25, 26, and 27, D, D, and C. So if you got them right, go to the last three problems. If not, stay here. All right, starting off, Kate has a coin collection. She keeps seven in a box, uh, which is only 5% of her entire collection. So this 5% is a ratio. So you know what that means, because I want to know the total number of coins. We're going to make another ratio table. And 7% or 5% means 5 out of 100. So part to total. Uh, she has 7 in the box, which it is the 5%. So our 7 is the part, which is 5% of our entire collection. So we're going to leave that here. That's the end. We're going to cross multiply and you get 700 is equal to 5n. We're going to divide both sides by 5. And if you need to do the long division, that's fine. Five goes into seven one time. Five goes into 24 times. And easy place to make a mistake. Don't forget, if I have three digits here, I need to have three digits on top. So 140. So that's the answer for number 25. On number 26, we have which point on a number line represents the opposite. So I want the opposite of five and a half. So I know that the opposite is going to be of negative five and a half is five and a half. So automatically, this is zero. I'm looking for the positive number, it has to be on this side. So these two are not it, because they're negative numbers. All right, so forget P and forget Q. Now I want five and a half. So duh, one, two, three, four, five. And a half because this would have been six so s is the right answer let's look at number 27 which of the following subtraction expressions has a difference equal to 22 and 17 so this one honestly it just means I got to do all of them and since we know it's easy places to make mistakes and I know there are different ways that different kids add and do all this stuff and you have different ones um, I'm going to subtract, I'm going to do trade first, meaning I'm going to start from the left and see if I have to do any borrowing. So can I do four minus one? Yes. Can I do two minus nine? No. So I have to borrow and turn this to a 12. Now I can do it. Can I do zero minus zero? Yes, but I cannot do seven minus nine. So I have to borrow from the zero, not enough. So I'm going to borrow from up here. So 11, this turns to a 10. Now I can borrow. 9 and this turns to a 17. So this one I can do 17 minus 9 is 8. 9 minus 0 is 9. 11 minus 9 is 2 and 3 minus 1 is 2. So that's not the same as 22 and 17 so I can cross the first one up. So like I said this one's just gonna you just have to sit here and, and take time doing it. And just looking at this one, can I subtract everything? I have to borrow for the first one so that I can do this. Now everything looks good. 
All right, six minus five is one, four minus three is one, 10 minus seven is three, and two minus nothing is two. So also doesn't equal 22 and 17. And obviously, since I'm telling you this is the right answer, it would be really embarrassing if I didn't have it. Uh, notice they didn't put a placeholder, so we're gonna put one. Look to see, do I have to do any regrouping? Not for the four, but for that two. So let's do that. Now I can do it. But I can't do zero minus nine. Now I'm good. All right, seven, one, two, two. There we go, 22, 17. That's what I wanted. And that's the correct answer. Uh, if you needed to see this last one, if not, go to the next section, just keep moving. <laughs> but if you need to see it, okay. Uh, did I have to do any borrowing? Yes, I had to right over here. So eight minus one is seven, nine minus seven is two, and I could already see it's not the right answer because I have two in the tens place. Two, 11 minus eight is three, and then, okay. Last ones, I'm tired. I'm really, really tired. Here's 28 and 29, A and A. And here's 30 D. So if you have them, you can check them off, turn off the video, and relax until you do part two. And if you need to go over, just stay here and we'll go over it together. Kim rode her bicycle 135 miles in nine weeks, riding the same distance each week. So this is a rate, a ratio. Eric, uh, so that's Kim, that's Kim's rate. Eric did 120 miles, 102 miles, in six weeks same distance each week which correctly compares the number per week so we need the rates okay so we're going to very quickly make ratios for both Kim and Eric all right Kim's time is 134 miles in nine weeks I want to know how many miles in one week so actually you know what I want to do for this um, I'm going to show you how I can do this in two ways I can do this as a ratio table or I can do it with division so I'm going to show you both and then you decide what you want me to do for Eric so here I would get when I cross multiply 135 divided by 9 n and I'm going to have to divide both sides by 9 to get n so when I look at that do you notice that my original rate is right here what if I just divided 135 by 9 from the beginning so I could make the ratio table and if that's super helpful for you do it um, but you could you're gonna end up with the same 135 divided by 9 so that's what we're gonna that's what I'm gonna work out now anyway so 9 goes into 135 Zero, I'm putting a zero there. One, so that's 45, and nine goes into 45 five times. So our unit rate for Kim, she does 15 miles per week. Let's do Eric, and Eric's rate is 102 miles in six weeks. So decide, do you want to do a table? Or do we want to just do 102 divided by six? Which would you rather do? I think most people would want to just divide. So let's do that. Six goes into 102. Zero one times, that's six. 42, six goes into 42 seven times. All right, so Eric's time is 17 miles per week and Kim's is 15 miles per week so the first one is correct Eric rode two miles more per week than Kim so not only did we have to find the rates but then we had to compare them and let me know in the comments which one it makes more like which would you do would you have done the ratio table to find Eric's or would you have just stayed with the division completely up to you Let's go to 29. Which number has an absolute value greater than five? So it has a greater than five. Okay, so the absolute value of six is six. 
because negative 6 is just 6 away from 0. The absolute value of negative 5 is 5. The absolute value of 0 is 0. And the absolute value of 5 is 5. So the only one that has the greatest, a value that's greater than 5, that's what we were looking for, was negative 6. And now for the final, final one. Here we go. We want to know which inequality in terms of x is graphed on the number line. And you really had to notice it over here. So starting from 2. And it's every number to the left of 2. So everything to the left of 2. Because I know my bigger number is on the right, this is the inequality I can write. Now, the other thing to notice is this is a filled in circle. So that means every number that is less than 2 or equal to 2. So that's important. If it had looked like this, then I would have written just x is less than 2. And that is a distractor. Here is my distractor right here. But because that that bubble is filled in, I have to include 2 as a possible solution. So 2 is a solution, so it can be less than 2 or equal to 2. And that's why the answer is D. So that's it uh, for all the multiple choice. I know it took a long time. We did it all about calculators. I hope you found this super helpful and that it helps to get you ready for the state test. Anything in the comments, if you're unsure of something, you have questions, put it in the comments. And if there are videos that you want to see or topics you want covered, put them in as well. That's it for today, Math Marvels. We'll see you after the sixth grade test when you're doing more geometry, I think is the, the next topic. Or is it